right, our agenda for this evening. So a couple things we're gonna talk about getting started is we're gonna talk about being a citizen lobbyist and what that means. We're also gonna talk about the, the roles, right? What's the role of citizens in this process of lobbying, right? Where do we fit into that landscape? We're gonna talk about creating your story because uh, members of Congress and their staff will tell you that um, a citizen who has a story uh, is a much better citizen than the, a citizen who has an opinion. And we'll talk about the differences between those in just a few moments and we'll share a, a quick video we're gonna watch on tonight's um, lesson as well uh, from our friends at the Congressional Management Foundation about this aspect of creating our own story. We'll talk about what's our advantage. What advantage do we have as being citizens in this lobbying process? And then we're gonna wrap up talking about building relationships. So what's it like to be a citizen advocate or a citizen lobbyist? Well, for those of you who know Marshall Saunders, this is our founder, and Marshall always makes a great case for what it means to be an engaged and active citizen. He says, ordinary people like you and me have to organize, educate ourselves, give up our hopelessness and powerlessness, and gain the skills to be effective with our government. Let me say that again. Ordinary people like you and me have to organize, educate ourselves, give up our hopelessness and powerlessness, and gain the skills to be effective with our government. Now, there are a lot of folks in CCL who have you know, firsthand knowledge of what this means and, and how they've become a more effective citizen. And we've asked a few of them to join us tonight so they can share with you what it means uh, to be a citizen lobbyist. And first up is Bill Barron. Bill Barron is our Wild West Regional Coordinator. And Bill, if you could start off tonight, remember you'll need to unmute yourself. Um, if you would start us off and just answer a couple of questions. Um, those questions being, you know, what does it mean to you personally? You've been doing this for a while to be a citizen advocate or a citizen lobbyist. What does that mean to you? And then would you share if there was a, maybe an aha moment where you sort of realized that, wow, this really works and what that was like, or you know, where you realized you can make a difference? Sure, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we got you loud and clear. Um, well, I think being a citizen advocate for me really means actively participating in the political process. And uh, it feels really good to be doing that. And uh, you know, I, I like that the work that we are doing, I believe is for the sake of the greater good. And so it's, for me, it's a really great way to communicate my concern. And uh, it's being able to stand up for what I believe in and to be talking to our political leaders about it in a relationship building way. And I've seen lots of personal growth from participating this way. I think for me, my aha moment was really the first time I went to Washington, D.C. to lobby back in 2010. I was terrified to be uh, lobbying my member of Congress, and I didn't feel like I was enough of a person to be there sort of uh, perspective. And uh, by actually doing it, I realized that I could firsthand that I could do it and that it was really empowering and rewarding for me. And it made me want to do more and to realize that, you know, stepping out of my comfort zone is actually uh, kind of a great way to do things sometimes. And uh, I found a lot of growth in the process of doing it. All right. Thank you so much, Bill. Bill's going to stick around and, uh, you know, he'll help us answer questions at the end. Um, uh, I'll be surprised if Amy and Andy don't say that their first aha moment was their first time in D.C. as well, because <laughs> I think it is for most of us. But so let's talk about let's move on here um, and we'll have Andy and Amy share in just a few moments. But let's talk about, you know, why do we lobby as a citizen? Right. And so you know, there's a really, this is a simple reason why we have like the stereotypes that are associated with lobbying and, and why companies are willing to pay so much for lobbyists, right, themselves. And that's because it works, right? But the, the main point here that we want to uh, convey tonight is that successful lobbyists, whether they're a, a paid professional lobbyist or whether they're a, a passionate citizen, the main thing that they do, or the most effective ones do one thing, and that's develop relationships. And the good news there is, right, you don't need millions of dollars to develop relationships. We all know how to do that. And so we're going to talk about building relationships here in just a moment. But the role of citizens, you know, it's, it's pretty simple. You know, you think about this, that it's not possible for a member of Congress or their staff to 
to know every detail about various policies, right? So they do rely on others to inform them. And so that's one of the main reasons we meet with them. But unfortunately, there is a group that is out there informing. There's a couple of groups out there informing them as well, right? That's lobbyists, that's your industry, and that's party, right? So the other thing to consider is this. If we are not meeting with them, who is? And we know who is, right? Lobbyists, industry lobbyists, and you know, people from their own party. So it's imperative that the role of us for as citizens that we get involved. And if you think about it, you know, the paid lobbyists meet quite often with their members of Congress, and so should we. And really what we're doing is simply making a case for what we believe Congress um, should do or what we want them to do. Now, when setting a legislator's agenda, constituents always figure prominently. Uh, Brad Fitch from the Congressional Management Foundation uh, had a, a stat on where he, he t or shows us uh, uh, statistics where they uh, survey members of Congress or their staff, and they ask constituents, you know, how prominent do you think you figure in a member of Congress's um, daily agenda? And constituents always answer that question, and it's about like seven or eight percent. And then, the, but you ask the same question to the member of Congress and their staff, and it's like 80%. So there's a big uh, divide there between what constituents think and what actually happens. Any constituent who makes the effort to travel to Washington almost always will get a meeting with a member of Congress or their staff. And Amy can probably talk about this later when we get to her point. I, I, I don't think, there, there are not many examples where a constituent goes to DC and doesn't get some type of meeting, uh, either with a member of Congress or their staff. But congressional staffers, whether they be past or present, will tell you that there are two types of constituents and that they're not always given equal weight. And let me give you an example. There are those with an opinion. If a constituent stands up at a town hall and says, I think we should reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you know, the congressman or congresswoman is gonna file that away in one part of their brain. But if the same constituent stands up and says, I think we should reduce greenhouse gas emissions because my three-year-old daughter has respiratory problems. Well, I guarantee the congressman, congressman is going to file that in a completely different compartment. That person has a much stronger bond to the legislator at that point. And he, and that legislator has a much greater obligation at that point to integrate that person's concerns into their decision-making. So the lesson here, the lesson that we hear from Congress is that constituents with a genuine interest and a story are more likely to have influence than those who are simply coming in and telling. And this is important for us in a couple of aspects. So we, uh, you know, over the past five, six, eight years have become a, an organization that's been very good at meeting with member of Congress and doing it often. And sometimes we forget this part, the part about storytelling because we've met with a member of Congress and their staff so many times. But what we want to try to stress here is that if you're meeting someone for the first time, whether it be a member of Congress or their staff, or maybe it's the second time, or maybe there's people in your group who have met, haven't met with a member of Congress before, it's a good idea to tell a story. Tell a story at the beginning. Uh, it creates a bond and it creates a connection with that member of Congress or that, st that person you're talking to. So what we're going to do right here real quick is we are going to show a short video from our friends at the Congressional Management Foundation about how to create stories to move the hearts, minds, and votes of lawmakers. So give me just one moment. And uh, Bill, if you'll give me a thumbs up once this starts, just to make sure. <laughs> I like to see. And move this share box. Hello and welcome to this short video, Creating Effective Stories to Share with Lawmakers. This video is part of the Congressional Management Foundation's Partnership for a More Perfect Union. We're proud to work with Citizens Climate Education as they empower their supporters to build productive, long-term relationships with members of Congress. In this video, we'll discuss the value of storytelling in the public policy process. We'll walk you through seven elements of good public policy storytelling. And while not part of this video, CMF has an exercise that you can engage in on your own to develop your own story. 
So why is storytelling important in the public policy process? Well, one reason is this. When we dream alone, it is only a dream. But when we dream together, it is no longer a dream, but the beginning of reality. We like to think that we come to conclusions and reasoning through a rational method. We ponder something, we then analyze it, and then we make a decision. But that's not exactly how our brains are wired. What we really do is we see, we then feel, and then we make a decision. Using stories is one of the most powerful ways to evoke an emotion in anyone, including an undecided lawmaker. We also know through congressional research that we've conducted that storytelling, especially by constituents, can be powerful. The Congressional Management Foundation conducted a survey of senior congressional staff and asked this question. If your member or senator has not already arrived at a firm decision on an issue, how much influence might the following advocacy strategies directed to the Washington office have on his or her decision? 97% of the congressional staff responding to the survey said an in-person visit from a constituent. 96% said contact from a constituent's representative. But what are they looking for in those interactions with constituents? We included a survey question which asked just that. 48% of the respondents said a personal story related to the bill or issue would be helpful or very helpful. 74% said the constituents reasoning for supporting or opposing the bill or issue. And 77% said information about the impact the bill would have on a district or state. Here you see the basic elements of how you could create a story to influence lawmakers. One member of Congress said this way, I went to a luncheon that was hosted by cancer centers in my state. Instead of having those guys in white coats doing their lobbying, they brought in patients, kids and their parents. They all got up and told their story. When it was done, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. So what are the seven elements of good public policy storytelling? First, begin with the end in mind. Know what the want is. If you're trying to influence lawmakers or trying to get them to understand the impact your organization has on a district or state, know what you want to accomplish. Know what the ask is. A storyteller also lays the groundwork and knows where they're going. And consider various tactics and methods for achieving your goal, whether that be flattery, surprise, restraint, or emotion. Element number two, the opening. Set the stage and establish the stakes. The storyteller should know what the first couple of sentences are going to be, a hook that makes the audience, in this case a lawmaker, want to know more. They should establish context for the life or organization that you're going to be describing. And what's at stake for the community or a family or even your organization? Element number three, Paint the picture. What are the details and what are the senses? What's the taste, touch, hear, and feel that happens? What did you see or hear or taste or smell? You want to create a vivid picture for the audience. Remember, the adjectives of the situation can be incredibly powerful and very helpful to your storytelling. And make it real. Be practical, specific, and graphic. And don't hold anything back. Element number four, the struggle. Describe the fight. Every good story has an antagonist and a protagonist. Identify the conflict. Struggles don't have to be between two organizations. They can be mental, philosophical, or even internal. And play the underdog. Turn weakness into strength. Everyone loves underdogs. They always want to see David beat Goliath. Turn that to your advantage. Element number five, the discovery. Always surprise your audience with something in the middle or near the ending of your story. Wait until it has the most impact. Put it in context between the past and the present and the future. Ask, 
What did you learn from this and how did that learning impact your life or others now and in the future? Make it last and make it powerful. One of the most powerful elements in public policy storytelling is the introduction of the potential for success and joy. Element number six, we can win. This is defined by success with the hero or heroine winning and it's also an element of comfort and joy as the audience participates in the process. Every legislator and staff member wants that winning feeling when they're helping out a community or an organization. Give them that opportunity to participate in your success. And the last sentence is essential to good storytelling, what they call in Hollywood, the button. Finish with a hook. If you're going to interact with a lawmaker and their staff, know what that last sentence is going to be. Memorize it and know when to use it. And exercise restraint. Knock them over with a feather because of its good crafting. And remember why you're telling the story to a public policy official in the first place. Because we in America do not have a government by the majority. We have a government by the majority who participate. So let's stop right here and let's hear from another one of our um, uh, veteran CCL uh, lobbyists here, Mr. Andy Beers. And Andy is our uh, CCL Strategic Partnerships Coordinator. And Andy, um, if you would, go ahead and unmute your line. And uh, what I'd like for you to do is, you know, really answer the same questions that Bill did earlier. You know, what does it mean being a citizen advocate or citizen lobbyist to you? And, and what was your aha moment? Thank you, Ricky. So the first question, what about what being a citizen advocate uh, means to me? Um, for me, it means taking ownership of citizenship on a level that I don't think I'd ever done before. Um, you know, you talked a lot about, or a bit about the difference between having opinions um, and having real reasons. And for me, I think that uh, being a citizen advocate kind of put me in a place where I had to really be able to back up opinions that I had held for a while and do that not just by uh, coming with kind of a logical support for the opinions that I already um, held and really thinking things through on a deeper level, but also by engaging people with opposing points of view and respecting those opposing points of view enough to um, engage with them 100%. So that's kind of the next level beyond voting, um, beyond talking to friends who might feel the same way. Uh, it's just, it's engaging with fellow citizens as a citizen. That's very important to me. In terms of my aha moment, uh, it won't surprise you, like you said, to, to know that that happened during my first um, session on Capitol Hill. Uh, I had been assigned to do the appreciation for the meeting. And we went in and, you know, it was a meeting that I didn't, it, it was an office that I didn't expect to have a particularly great meeting with. Um, the, the congressman was on record as being, um, you know, kind of flirting with climate denial and so forth. Uh, and when we went in, we were meeting, we ended up meeting with his staffer instead of with the congressman. And I was a little disappointed, didn't get to really do the appreciation quite so much. And the staffer kind of could have cared less that we were, we were there, he was being very curt. And then um, eventually the congressman wandered through and introduced himself briefly. And when he got around to me, I was able to finally say thank you for some work on water that he's done in the state of California, um, kind of a not, not directly climate related issue. And I could just see the lights kind of go on for him. Um, it turned from a perfunctory introduction around the room uh, to you know, him being truly engaged and, and sticking with us for a period of time. And, you know, and then the staffer kind of played off him as well and, and started engaging more directly. And, you know, I don't know that we really moved him that much, except to the point of being willing to talk to us again and continue to have that conversation. And that was, that was very important to me to see that, you know, this really works. Um, it, engaging on that level is the right thing to do. It's also very effective. So that was, that was a big moment for me. Thank you so much for, for sharing your story, Andy. And I appreciate that, that perspective of, uh, you know, uh, sort of your metamorphosis uh, <laughs> so to speak. And so thank you so much for sharing that. So let's go ahead and continue here and let's talk about a few other things before 
uh, we wrap up tonight and we'll stop again for, for Q&A. So uh, next we want to talk about, you know, what to expect uh, as, uh, when you are lobbying and being a citizen lobbyist and, you know, what, what, what can you expect when you go to, to lobby with CCL uh, in particular? So first thing you can expect is that um, you're not going to be sent in alone, <laughs> right? You're going to be sent in uh, with a team, a team of lobbyists, uh, and you'll have a team leader, someone who's a little more experienced, maybe, uh, maybe very experienced, but uh, at a minimum has been in a couple of meetings before and has experienced um, what it means and, and CCL's methods for lobbying. Um, uh, we expect people to be flexible, especially if you're going to Washington, D.C., uh, things can change uh, from uh, hour to hour with members of Congress and their staff changing things up to the last moment and appointment time. So uh, expect to be flexible even in the district as well. Um, uh, expect everyone to be in business attire. So we do want to uh, show uh, respect for the office that they hold. When you go into a meeting, uh, you can expect to meet with a young assistant to be greeted at the front desk uh, by that person who, if, in, if they're in D.C., they're usually someone from back home uh, because that creates an instant connection. It gives people a chance to, to chat with that person about uh, where they're from. And so it's usually a, a young staff assistant that you'll be greeted by. Um, that person will usually ask you, oh, do you have your business cards? Um, that serves a couple of purposes. Not only does it help them log who was having a meeting with them, um, but it also serves to let them know, uh, really solidify who is a constituent in this meeting. And you'll see them glance at the business cards and at the addresses for sure. You'll be seated with a staffer or a member of Congress. Um, and if you're in DC, you'll notice that uh, the offices are extremely small and cramped. And if that's the case, you may end up meeting in the hall or even in the lobby of the office. And although that can feel strange at times, uh, know that we are not the only ones who do that. <laughs> and so they have these meetings all the time in the lobby uh, because they, they have very, very small offices. Um, and you'll notice that when you get, uh, get into the office as well. So let's talk about building relationships a little bit here because this is the thing um, that uh, really puts us on uh, even footing with the professional lobbyists, right? But there are also some things that we have to consider that, uh, you know, maybe we actually have advantages uh, over a professional lobbyist, right? So before we begin discussing how to build that relationship, let's take a quick look at the differences between uh, lobbying as a citizen and professional lobbying, right? So obviously a paid lobbyist is a hired gun, and a, a citizen lobbyist is usually a constituent, not always. We'll talk about, you know, we go into some meetings and we're not the constituent, but we're there. There may be a constituent present, uh, present. If you talk to a staffer, they'll tell you that a paid lobbyist has an opinion, again, but a citizen lobbyist is, is, is usually someone who's passionate with an interest and has a story that connects with the member of Congress. A paid lobbyist is frequently in DC, you know, obviously we're only very occasionally in DC unless you live in the DC area, but a paid lobbyist is rarely in the district and we're always in the district. So that's an advantage for us. You know, the takeaway here is that we're offering very something different you know, that's been done, that's been ever been done before, but we don't have every advantage. We, we have a passionate interest in the topic. Uh, we live in the lawmakers district. So we really ought to play to those advantages as well. But there's also one thing that we both have in common, and it's this. It's what members of Congress are looking for. That is the ability to use the most influential tool of a lobbyist. And the most valuable gift a lobbyist can give a member of Congress, it's not a campaign contribution, but it's a detailed analysis of how a particular issue is going to affect the lawmaker's district or their state. Again, the most influential tool of a lobbyist is knowledge of how a policy decision is going to impact the state or the district. You know, so some state associations, nonprofits and corporate leaders, you know, they may offer that kind of data, but many do not. And we can say with certainty that no one, save CCL, 
and maybe some of our partners who've been lobbying on, on, uh, with us uh, on, well, for carbon fee and dividend on our behalf as well, really is identifying researching how carbon fee and dividend impacts the legislators' districts and their constituents. This is our most valuable tool. We have this information and we are trained on how to communicate it and how to deliver carbon fee and dividend. We had to play to those strings, right? So let's talk about building relationships and then we're gonna hear from Amy Bennett and then we're gonna wrap up and, um, and take time for some questions here. So building relationships. So how do we go about building relationships with folks who we may see every one, only every once in a while, you know, a member of Congress or their staff? Well, it's kind of simple. It's, you know, in Dale Carnegie training, you're taught the best way to win friends and influence people is to understand their problems and their interests. And that'll help us understand how to influence them. So understanding how Congress works and the context within which they operate uh, is very important. We have a Congress 101 lesson that we did last week. It'd be great uh, to go back and listen to that and to see uh, just how busy a member of Congress is. On an average day, they'll have 13 meetings. So in, as an advocate, you'll be much more powerful if you start a conversation by asking a congressman something about themselves, right? Ask them about a kid who just went off to college or mention you saw them at a, uh, in a newspaper recently, maybe is at a ribbon cutting or a, a, at an event in the district. Remember, part of the job, the reason that why lobbyists, uh, paid lobbyists are so successful is because they do know their issue. They're paid to do so, right? So we can become trusted advisors as well or policy experts. We can do that. We have very specific information regarding how our policy is going to impact their state or district. No one else has that information. Now, every congressional office knows this person as well. Uh, the type of person, the in-district in advocates who stays on top, top of the issues and who doesn't hesitate to communicate frequently with their members of Congress. And that's very important to developing a relationship. If we just pop in once in June and then we're out, and we don't follow up and we don't um, work with the local staff, it's going to be very hard to develop that long-term positive relationship. So show up and be visible. Keeping in regular contact with your member of Congress provides a valuable service to them and it really keeps them accountable to their constituents. Now there's one last uh, special situation that you may experience if you go to lobby in a place like DC because we're trying to cover every single congressional office and we may not always have a constituent that shows up uh, for a meeting with a member of Congress. Maybe it's uh, in an area where we just don't have a lot of people or maybe for some reason some, we just could not get a constituent in that meeting. So, um, and it's, Let's face it, it's kind of expensive to go to DC, so not everyone can afford to be there. So even though no constituents are in a meeting, we still have information about how our policy is going to impact their district, right? That's our political capital. We're really there at that point to act as a policy advisor. We're giving them data, right? Think about this. Paid lobbyists, they're not constituents either. I mean, maybe they are, but the large part they're not, right? They are there to give them data and to try to persuade them. So you, we can do the same. Now, they don't always like to meet with non-constituents, but you can say, look, I've got some data for you on how this is gonna impact your district. They'll be more likely to, to listen to you. Additionally, you will, you'll wanna mention, hey, you know, we do have supporters in the district. We have you know, 30 or 40 supporters in the district. And also in these instances, it's important to remember just a couple of things. As a non-constituent, you really have this like sacred duty and trust to enhance the relationship, right? So that the constituents that are back in the district really can pick up the conversation where you left off. We want to make sure we, we bolster the relationship of the constituents back home. So don't relax just because it's, you're not, this is not your member of Congress. Really think about those folks back home and, and what you can do to make it easier for them uh, later in the year or early next spring when they go meet with their member of Congress or their staff. If there are no constituents um, in the meeting, assume the role of someone who represents the constituents' interests. Of course, there's a lot more to building relationships uh, than these three things. There's a, a lot more we could go into about the storytelling and how to build your story. Uh, the good thing is that uh, that lesson, the storytelling lesson, you can go back and listen to it. It's available on CCL Community and our YouTube channel as well. But this really can start a framework uh, that can blossom in many different directions. So once you know the office, 
once they know you, you've connected with them through stories, you're a trusted advisor, you're in frequent contact with them, uh, you'll practice this situational awareness and you'll figure out how to deepen that relationship with the member of Congress. So last up tonight, we're going to talk to Amy Bennett, and I don't know if you want to save the best for last. Maybe that's the case here. Uh, but, uh, you know, Amy, I kid her, I've said to her a few times in the past, that I consider Amy CCL's historian. And not that that means because she's old, uh, but because she's been around a long time, she likes to, to, to she gathers all this information. And um, you can ask Amy uh, just about any question about CCL and she's gonna know the answer. So uh, Amy, um, if you wouldn't mind wrapping up tonight and uh, before we get to the Q&A and tell us you know, from your experience and you've been with CCL a, a quite a long time, maybe tell us like how long, um, but what does it mean being a citizen advocate to you? And what was your aha moment where you figured out, oh, this is, this is really cool and this works? <laughs> Thanks, Ricky. Thanks, Ricky. Uh-oh, uh -oh, I think we uh -oh, got the echo. Maybe if Maybe you don't, don't screen, share. screen share. Okay, let me unscreen share. No Is that better? Yeah? How's, okay, there we go. Well, this goes way back, even before the first conference. And uh, I think, Bill, you might have been there at the, my first conference. But before that, I think I kind of grew up with being taught by my dad to leave the world a better place. We used to hike around Point Reyes and really developed a love of nature and a love of the ocean. And now I'm in Southern California and same thing. Um, the, that married my passion for nature and the ocean and coupling that with really wanting to leave the world a better place in a pragmatic way really led me to get involved in the climate issue. And I remember my first trip when we were in DC and uh, that evening before the sunset, I walked down to the White House right outside the White House and called my husband, had to leave a message, but I was just sobbing with joy that I was there. This was what, 2009, I think. Um, I was there to do what Washington DC was designed for, to be an active participant. And that's to me what lobbying is about. My husband saved that message for me for the longest time, <laughs> but it was so exciting to say, I'm gonna participate, I'm gonna do I'm going to take the actions that will make the place, make the world a better place. So that was, uh, that's what it means to me. My aha moment, a few of those, um, one, just knowing that I wasn't going to be alone, that I was supported by a team of lobbyists and a lot of other support, like what Ricky, you built into this, this great education program, but also experiencing in lobby meetings that listening and acknowledging the member of Congress's point of view really works. And the more patient I could learn to be, the more rewarding that was to the relationship. And allowing and acknowledging that other person's values allowed that person to then hear what I had to say. Um, so that, and change their own mind in the process rather than me telling the person to change their mind. I'll give you an example. This was a meeting, Andy, you were in this meeting with me and it was a meeting of, uh, in a, of a district that was in a fossil fuel state. And we actually had developed a very, very respectful relationship with the, the staffer. And we, in the meeting, did a lot of time listening, asking open-ended questions about this member's preferred method of working on the climate issue. We knew that they weren't gonna be interested in attacks. They didn't like that idea. Uh, so we really listened a lot and acknowledged that they, didn't, they did not like the idea of attacks. And by the end of it, the aide said, you know, we know Citizens Climate Lobby really is a respectful organization and we know that you'd never say anything bad about our office or negative. And likewise, we never will uh, say anything negative about you. We, you're, the door is always open for you guys to come visit. Uh, at this point, we didn't even have a constituent in the meeting and they had been meeting with us for several years. And uh, we finally asked the question, so what, you know, is there anything you do like about our, our proposal? And they actually said, yes, we love its revenue neutrality. And so maybe that's just an inch up the ladder, but that was a very valuable inch and, and we still have an open, you know, really good relationship with that office. So that was, uh, that was my aha moment that listening can work. 
Oh, fantastic, Amy. So, um, Andy, Bill, no, no slight to you, but see why I asked Amy to go last? I mean, she just, she cleaned your clocks, man. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> they're, they're, I'm going to get hate mail from those guys. Uh, no, no. So, okay, a couple of things. Uh, let's, I want to just, uh, I don't want to share the screen again, but I will take Amy's. Uh, we won't have to have, watch Amy the whole time there. Uh, <laughs> unless you want to be there the whole time, maybe. Um, so, uh, just a couple of key learnings, and we're going to stop for, for Q&A. Um, key learnings. Paid lobbyists versus engaged citizens and the difference between the two and, and why we really do um, have an advantage in a lot of ways over paid lobbyists. Um, again, uh, key learning, our most influential tool, um, besides I think our stories, um, is how will our policy impact the member's district, right? That's very, very important for them to know. Uh, we understand the difference between having an interest and having an opinion, uh, how to connect with a story, which is so important, and then the whole uh, aspect of respect, appreciation, and gratitude. Um, you know, Amy, I'm not going to put you on, the, well, I'm going to put you on the spot um, because I know you have this um, and I didn't ask you to prepare this, but, um, and maybe we'll, we, you can think about it for a second, but um, that part about connecting with the story, I'm sure you've done this before, right? You've been in a member of Congress, you've, you've developed your story. Um, is, there, is there a chance maybe you want to share uh, what your story is that you've used in the past to connect with the member of Congress's office? Well, oftentimes that's been somebody other than myself, and I love Brad's uh, video. I'm going to go back and watch that again because I really do want to buff out my story with yeah. the exact right points. But loving the ocean like I do, I, I love to express that. And also that it's just not my love of the ocean, but what I'm seeing in my own coastal region in Southern California, the, uh, the ocean's warming. We're seeing um, uh, Sea lions die because the water is so warm that the new pups stay at home while mom goes out to colder water to fish and she ends up not being able to get, get, give them the nutrition they need. We're seeing a, a big die off on, on sea lions. Fishermen are very well aware of what's going on in our area and are really concerned because all up and down the Pacific coast, we've seen major die offs of fish. Um, and, and our tur tourism industry is very dependent on beaches that are in good shape. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that I can bring. The, the three I think are important that I'm passionate about nature, but it's going to affect the economy here. And, um, and we're seeing it. We're seeing the oceans change every day. And I'm weekly right out on the beach seeing it. Uh, and we want our member to be a hero and, and take some steps to stop that from accelerating. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. That's, uh, <laughs> I knew you could do that on the spot. I know you're good at that. Um, but, you know, as to Brad's point, it doesn't always have to be um, really emotional or a place or anything like that. And we talk a lot about save versus saver in our uh, climate advocate training and our group will uh, start workshops. Um, but for someone like me, um, I think, uh, you know, my personal story is just, it's less emotional, but I, after realizing for, 40 something years that I'd been a part of the problem. Uh, it would kind of hit me like a ton of bricks and it was like, wow, I need, uh, I need to be a part of the solution now and I need to be held accountable for, for the things that I've done as well um, to, to worsen the situation. And so for me, it was all about accountability um, uh, versus, you know, having a, an actual place I love or having kids that, you know, I want to pass on a, a cleaner planet for because I don't have kids. So everyone has their own personal story. Again, um, Brad's point is that uh, you probably want to develop it and be able to express whatever that is. All right, so let's go ahead and stop for, for questions and answers and Andy and Amy and Bill. Um, being that you guys are the veterans, I want you to help out here with uh, a little bit of Q&A. So again, everyone has been muted. So if you have questions about, um, you know, citizen lobbyist, um, you know, um, developing your personal story, um, the most influential tool, any of those kinds of questions, uh, please feel free. Uh, you can uh, unmute yourself, uh, click the little microphone symbol next uh, in the lower left-hand portion of your screen, tell us your name and where you're joining from, or if you're on the phone, uh, do star six and tell us the same thing. Hi, I'm Debbie. Um, I'm in New Hampshire, and uh, I want to know, what if you don't have a really good, compelling story? I'm just a privileged kid who, who has, like, not really impacted that strongly by climate change. So what can I say? Amy, Bill, Andy, you want to jump in, or you want me to jump in? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, 
I, I would probably dispute the idea that there's anybody that doesn't have a potential story. I mean, I like, you know, I wouldn't shortchange your kind of hopes for the future or why it is you do this. So even if it's not a story from the past or even in the present, you know, I mean, there's some reason that you do this. There's something that you're concerned about. Maybe there's a memory that you have that hasn't been hit by climate change, but you're concerned that it, would, it, it would, wouldn't be available for the next generation, or you're concerned about a specific potential outcome for people on the other side of the world. But that, that all counts. I mean, it's a, it's a question of just going into what, what matters to you. Um, you know, it, it can be something that's a, that's a story in the commonly you know, understood way or, or something that's just meaningful. And I think that's, that's really what it's about. It's, it's, it's kind of like putting yourself out there a little bit. Um, and and being upfront about why you care. Yeah, love it. Thanks, Andy. Anyone, uh, Amy, uh, Bill, you want to add to that or? You know, I I used to keep a journal, and I found that there were, although most of it was stuff you would never want to repeat. I started finding commonalities in feelings that I had and stories that I found myself saying over and over again. I would encourage you to. Think about you know what you really care about and why and just talk about it or write it down and it just might all of a sudden surprise you that's a great idea thank you both yes yeah I, I couldn't add much more to that I think that's that's great advice great thank you appreciate it um, for you thanks for the question and if you got another question that's fine uh, we just uh, had a question from from X whoever X is in the chat <laughs> wants to know, how do we find uh, information on how a member, how this, um, our policy will impact a member of Congress's district? Um, and so I don't want to screen share again, because I think for some reason that's creating echo. Um, but if you go to uh, CCL community or to our main website, X, and if you type in and you search for the household impact study, um, that's a study that we commissioned uh, last year or two years ago. And what it does is it takes a look at the different socioeconomic groups that are within uh, each district and shows them uh, how they would benefit or, uh, and in certain cases, how they would not benefit uh, under our policy. So um, that's the, the, um, uh, that's how you can find it. It's called the household impact study. You could ask your group leader and you could also ask, um, uh, any of your regional coordinators, they can help point you to that. Uh, Jeff asks a question, you know, how much time should a story take? Fantastic question, <laughs> right? Um, and I guess what I'd say to, I'll try to answer that is, um, you know, you may only have, if a member of Congress says, oh, my meeting's only gonna be 10 minutes long, uh, you may not have that long to tell a story, right? So I think it's, you know, using your situational awareness figuring out, I'm getting a lot of music from somebody. Uh, hang on one second. No, that was you, Jeff, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you can, we'll, uh, we'll have you in just a second. Um, uh, so just, you know, practice awareness. Uh, if they tell you you only have 15 minutes, you, you know, you don't have time for three people to tell their story. Um, but I would say if you could tell your story in 60 seconds, that seems to be a, a pretty good a way. And it doesn't have to be like at the beginning either. It can be, you know, as you're making a point or talking about the policy and like, you know, saying that this is why this is so important to me. But I think it usually helps if you tell it more at the beginning because it helps to create that bond and that connection. Bill, Amy, Andy, anything you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, yeah, just I would say that um, don't necessarily, although the storytelling is incredibly important, don't necessarily get married to the idea that it has to be your particular story. I mean, there's limited time in here. So if somebody has come in and said something that obviously connects, um, you can just let that be, you know, that, that that connection has been made between the group and the person. So it's not like everybody in a six person meeting needs to have an anecdote that somehow creates this bond. So it's all just part of the flow. Um, and, you know, once, once that, once that meeting is on that footing, great, you can kind of move ahead. That's a great point. All right. Uh, yes. As, has anybody thought about uh, compiling some sample stories that we could view, um, you know, as part of a webinar or s uh, something on our site? I think what Jeff was just saying there is that he is willing to compile some stories for us. Uh, <laughs> didn't, that, didn't what it sounded like to you guys? Uh, <laughs> So come on. No, Jeff, I, I think that's a great idea. Um, and um, uh, I'll, uh, 
We'll see what we can, what, what we can round up. I think it's a fantastic idea. Absolutely. Uh, Bill, Andy, uh, or Bill, did you have a story that you like to share that you've shared in the past, a story of why, uh, you know, you're involved and, and, and you know, how you've connected with your member of Congress before? Um, yeah, I think, I think that um, the thing that I've found really effective is that, you know, I worked in the ski industry for a number of years. And so I am, it's very easy for me to keep it personal and talk about the changes that I saw while working on the mountain. And that, uh, you know, those impacts that we're seeing in the ski industry will have huge effects on our local economy. And, uh, you know, that it's a, it's a great way for me to keep it really personal and real and down to earth, but also be able to tie it in with the issue at large. And so that's, that's the angle that I use. Yep. And the important thing there is to be genuine. And obviously Bill's being genuine about that. That's something he's extremely passionate about. And a lot of people, it's um, their stories about their children and that's why they're there. Right. And it's because they have children and grandchildren or they want to have children and grandchildren. So the, the, the key there is to, to be genuine, but it will connect. Um, uh, yeah, there will, it will connect uh, with the member of Congress. Um, let's see, we still have time, about uh, 10 minutes or so, actually about nine minutes for questions. So if you could press uh, star six on your phone, unmute yourself, tell us your name and where you're joining from or, or press the microphone symbol. Hi, this is Catherine. And uh, I was wondering, Andy, we, you were the one that was quite uh, garbled over. And what I heard was uh, when you offered appreciation, you could see the light go on. And that was all that I could understand. Could you tell just a little bit more about that? Sure. I'm sorry about that. I thought the echo was just for me. And so I tried to kind of fight through it. So I apologize <laughs> for the, for the, for the feedback. Yeah, it was, it was a meeting in an, in an, in an office that I didn't expect to have a great relationship with necessarily, but I was in charge of appreciation there. And uh, the initial staffer that was in charge of the meeting just could have cared less, um, couldn't have cared less about, about our presence. It was a lot of court, curt sentences and stuff. And eventually the congressman kind of wandered in and you know, it was obviously very busy and all that kind of thing. And we did the brief introductions. Then I did my, the, the appreciation and just said, thank you so much for your work on you know, water storage in the state of California. It's so important to us all. And the, it just flipped. And he kind of like, you could just see him warm up right away. And he kind of, he had some sort of anecdote about how we would go into um, town hall meetings. And he was almost telling us that some of the kind of like climate denial stuff that he's on record with was almost just a way of like fighting back at people that he felt like was too, were too aggressive. He gets angry when people come and yell at him at town hall meetings. And, you know, so he pushes back with like, you know, yeah, I believe the ch climate changes, it changes every three months and just kind of blows off their concerns in return. And so it was kind of like there was an opening right there um, that I just found in, incredibly powerful and, uh, you know, really, really opened up how, how valuable a, a method and technique um, CCL has going here. So that was it. That's great. And so, so it was something specific. Uh, that's really critical. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank yeah you. definitely something specific. It's worth putting in the time doing the research on the appreciation. People really, really, they appreciate it when you know something they've done especially if it's not something climate related. Like, I mean, I honestly, if you know that they've done work on veterans affairs or something, it's like, in my experience, that's, they're impressed because they know that you've looked into it. They know that you're looking for a sense of, that it's not just about this one thing. Um, yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for the uh, thanks for getting that out because it was uh, very powerful, and I'm glad Andy was able to uh, have that uh, in an echo-free environment. So, <laughs> thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, again, we have uh, about six minutes left. If you have a question for Andy, Amy, or Bill, uh, please uh, star six if you're on the phone, or press the little uh, microphone symbol next to you or on the lower left-hand portion of your screen. Tell us your name and where you're joining from, and then ask your question. Okay, so this is Gloria. Can you hear me? Yes, Gloria. Go ahead. Where are you for calling from? Or Hi. So I'm calling from Del Mar, California, Southern California. Right, go ahead. So 
Um, since nobody jumped in with a question, I just wanted to comment on something that I've been working on within myself all day today um, with what's going on in Washington today and my representative, Daryl Issa. I'm recognizing that I'm going to be digging deep to find appreciation um, for somebody who is voting in some other areas in a way that I don't agree with. And I'm reminding myself that when I went to DC for the first time with results way back when, and I was working with Cunningham and some different people, Hunter, and there were issues that they believed in very strongly that were not in agreement with myself necessarily, but I could find that one square on the checkerboard where we could stand in agreement on something, providing a good future for our children, whatever it was, and I could find that one square and speak from that place. It created such a, a sense of solidarity and relief in the room that there was not a cantankerous situation, but there was a, a genuine sense of respect for that individual even if there were a whole bunch of other areas where we did not agree. And I'm recognizing I'm going to be really utilizing that tool again to move forward with this conversation with somebody that I may not agree with in other areas. So I just wanted to mention that. I don't know if that's helpful. No, uh, Gloria, I think that's tremendously helpful. You know, um, we base our organization on what, you know, some of Gandhi's beliefs, but let's face it, we're not Gandhi, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, we are human beings and uh, we bring all of our uh, senses, no matter, uh, you know, what they, what they are, the good and the bad to, to all of our meetings. So that's, um, it's, it's, I think what you said is incredibly powerful and important because um, it is realizing that we just need to just kind of stay focused and stay on track for what we're there for. And, um, you know, it's something that, you know, even in our meetings in our chapter meetings, we have to remind ourselves of all the time and heck, even our staff meetings, we ought to hear those. Jeez. They're, they're crazy off the board sometimes, <laughs> but no, that's, that's great. Thanks for reminding Gloria. That was really, really cool. Um, Craig says, uh, Craig Preston, California says, you know, I tell a story about how my hometown of Watsonville, California, home of Martinelli's apple cider <laughs> is struggling to grow apples as there isn't enough cold winter days for the trees to replenish. Is it okay to tell a story about somewhere out of the district? Uh, absolutely. It's your story, Craig. So um, it's, it's what's personal to you. It's what's brought you to DC. It's what's brought you to advocacy. It's, it's, it's the reason. Um, if I want to share a place, it's, it's in Montana. And I talk about that quite often because I, um, used to work there and uh, you know Glacier National Park it doesn't really have any there's only like about 25 quote-unquote glaciers anymore they're really not they're just but um, so yeah it's it, it's whatever um, is personal to you it's what it's the reason why you were there so that's perfect uh, Amy Bill or uh, Andy anything you want to add to that yeah I think that just as long as you're being genuine about a, an experience or you know sharing it from your perspective uh, wherever that happens to be is where it's where it's most real for you. Yeah, better to um, be honest about a story from out of district than to try to force a connection um, <clears throat> into the, the, and you know the people recognize a genuine story that me, that's meaningful. So. Yeah, I could try to force a story about how it's getting really hot at the Texas Rangers games, but they might not really care too much about that. <laughs> that might not be the reason why they, I got into it. Um, Lowell uh, has a, a comment in the chat and says, seems like a big plus uh, would be quick on our feet when we get the cold shoulder, uh, that we come to the meeting with a recognition of, of the possibility. And, you know, and absolutely, um, not every meeting um, – is going to go great. I can tell you just my experience over the past four years, they've progressively gotten better. Um, and I don't know if it's because of CCL's reputation or, um, you know, we're just better prepared or what the case may be, but it's very rare that I've been in a bad meeting in the past couple of years out of, you know, if you add percentage wise, um, Andy, Bill, Amy, anything you want to say about that? I mean, what's your experience with that? 
Um, I'd add to that 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 we're going to see a lot of new members of Congress who may not know us yet, and so I think it, the appreciation is especially especially good to get off on the right foot because until they know who we are, there might be a preconceived you know idea that we're going to come and point fingers. And getting that that done right away up front with the appreciation, I think, can help redirect any fear that they have on their part that they're going to be yelled at by constituents coming into the office.